Hello and welcome to the Manchester is Red podcast. My name is Stephen Railston and I'm your host today. And I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Tyrone Marshall. You nearly forgot my name. I did, nearly forgot your been a while. Oh, it's been a long week, Tyrone. How are you? I'm good. Thank you, Rich. I mean, Stephen. <laughs> Who's Rich here? I don't know. The name is Guy Hall, but he's dead to us. Yeah, he's dead to us. I introduced uh, my podcast with Nathan Aspinall. Uh, darts them before of course in the world earlier in the week it's a very special podcast you don't get that treatment in Tyrone just a normal well, podcast I am wounded if I if I wasn't being paid to be here I would be leaving like, it's just me and you talking about United as usual uh, anyways Ty in this first section we'll discuss the Gareth Southgate links uh, and the interest and what that might mean for Eric Ten Hag and we'll get into some international stuff in the second part as ever Usually loads to talk about is the junior international break, but we'll make do. We'll find a way. We'll see if we can get it to 45 minutes. We'll see if we can. Um, anyways, that was start with Southgate. As I said, um, growing interest, should we say, from Ineos. Is it a surprise though? I mean, he's not. He's done a good job with England, but his last experience of club management saw so Millsborough relegated from the Premier mm. League. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's very hard to judge at what kind of level he's at, I think, isn't it? And he's, you know, I, I think we can see the reaction from, from United fans online. I mean, he's not, it's hard to judge where he's at and he's just not a, a sexy name, is he? He's called Gareth for a start, with apologies to any Gareth that are listening. Is Tyrone a sexy? Is, is Tyrone a Stephen? I would say, I would say Tyrone is. Yours is probably more sexy. Yeah, and Stephen. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I used to get compared to an old American actor called Tyrone Power. Now it's just a, a mechanic from Coronation Street. So things have gone downhill a bit. But yeah, back on to, on to Gareth. Um, yeah, it's, you know, he's, he's not, he's not a, a, a big name, is it? Well, he is a big name, but it's hard, like I say, it's hard to judge where he's at. He's done a good job, I think, with England. But should that put him in the frame for a job like United? I don't know. I think it's just impossible to judge where he would land if he went into club football. And I think he'd, if he got offered the United job, I think he'd A, be surprised and B, leave England after the Euros like that. I mean, there's definitely interest there. And you can see why Ratcliffe likes him a lot. Brailsford and Southgate have worked together or, or spoken a lot on all these leadership um, kind of events and things like that. Ashworth has obviously worked with Southgate. There's a lot of links there. There is definitely interest there. I kind, I kind of feel that if if Ineos had their way and could appoint any manager they want with no reaction, they might go for Southgate. But I'm not sure they will. And do you not think that's kind of why it came out at this point over the international break? Maybe to test the water as gauge fan reaction? Yeah. Because Sergio Ratcliffe has said all the right things and done all the right things since becoming a cool owner at the club but this has the potential to be a, a disastrous decision. Could, could it not? Yeah, well, I think, you know, there's, there's there's obviously been a lot of negative reaction to it. I mean, some of it is is social media fans going over the top and, and things like that, but it's clearly not going to be a name that inspires people, really. Just because, like you say, he's, he's done a good job with England. Not amazing, but certainly good. I think he's brought a lot of those players on. But like I say, he hasn't managed in club football since 2009. He got Middlesbrough relegated. And international football is just an entirely different kettle of fish these days. It's totally, totally different. So it's very hard to judge what he's done with England on on a club level. It's hard to know where that puts him in terms of club managers. So yeah, I think I think the reaction is probably one that would make Ineos think maybe not. And it should be said that there is no decision made on on Ten Hag yet. I mean, if you if you ask United fans, Ten Hag or Southgate. Yeah, it'd be high 90%, wouldn't it, for Ten Hag out of those Well, his, his popularity soared in the last week because not only has he had a 4-3 win or Liverpool and what a, what a performance that was, but the links have emerged to Gareth Southgate. So even those who were probably leaning toward Eric Ten Hag leaving at the end of the season are now thinking, I'd rather Ten Hag stay yeah. and we'll have Gareth Southgate. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And you know, it is still very much in the balance, I think, for Ten Hag. I mean, if, if he wins the FA Cup, beating City in the final and they get top five, say then, you know, you'd probably say he's done enough to get another season. I think there's obviously doubts still there. I think we all have doubts. I think Ineos still have doubts. And I still wouldn't entirely rule out the possibility of some kind of friction behind the scenes. You know, Ten Hag has made it abundantly clear twice now that he expects control over transfers. And I don't think that, you know, it depends how you define control, whether that's the final say, whether that's saying, I want Turo Malassa and Vuk Vegost, you know, there's obviously got to be a degree of working together, but it wouldn't surprise you if that developed into some kind of friction with with Ashworth or whoever else is brought in or Brailsford. You know, I, I don't think that's entirely out of the question that come the summer, there's there's going to be some some potential friction there, which might go into the decision from either party, quite quite possibly. I mean, it's, you know, I wouldn't expect that to happen, but equally I wouldn't rule it out. So, 
you know, it's it's still difficult to say what's going to happen with with Ten Hag because the season is eminently salvageable. You know, I I'm not sure it it will be salvaged, but on the face of it, their the recent form has been very good. And if he does win the cup, or even if he gets top five, you know, maybe that's enough to to buy him the start of next season. But the problem Ineos have got is if they're not entirely convinced, it's a lot more difficult to then make that decision in October or November than it is to make a clean break in the summer. We'll stick with Southgate then before we get into Tenaga a bit more as you've just done there. Um, You look at his record, semi-finals of the 2018 World Cup, obviously the final of the 2020 Euros and the loss to Italy in that final. Luke Shaw scored the goal in that game. Uh, The quarter-finals of the 22 World Cup um, in Qatar, obviously lost against France and Harry Kane missed a penalty, should have probably went through. I personally think it's a controversial point, actually. I know England fans are kind of split on Gareth Southgate. I've always defended him. I think he's done a really good job. Um, and I think he's been unique because of his personality and what he achieved in his playing career. Um, he, yeah, it's a bit of a cliche, but he gets what it means to uh, to be in that England kind of, doesn't he? And he's made playing for England, again, an enjoyable experience. Players like to play for the national team now. It was all those tales, wasn't it, about the, the golden generation and segregated mm-hmm. tables and yeah, it's completely yeah. different when you look at kind of footage coming out of St George's Park now um, but then on the flip side tactically there's been a lot of tactical concerns and as you said international football is different I think those tactics actually work on the international stage yeah. it's a different game as you said it's more pragmatic slower a bit more defensive but that's not going to go down well with United fans if that kind of football is seen at Old Trafford, is it? No, it isn't. Like we say, it's, it, it's, it is almost a totally different game in terms of the amount of time you get with players. I mean, I'm with you. I think he's done, you know, I think he's done a tremendous job, really, just in transforming the culture as much as anything, but also the success on the pitch. I mean, weirdly, probably the biggest negative is that Italy game, even though it was the final, because it, it didn't react, did it? It didn't that's react, and it was too slow. The France game, you know, I mean, I've said this on this podcast so many times, but because football is such a low scoring sport, it is so susceptible to luck. I mean, for me, England were the best team at the 2022 World Cup throughout the whole tournament. And by by a distance, I would say, across all of their games, you know, they were good in, I think, all of their games. They were the, undoubtedly the better team against France. You know, they lost because of a deflection, basically. Maguire's, you know, the, the header that went in off Maguire and a missed penalty. If you play that game back 10 times... Yeah, England will win it seven win times, eight, I would say. Maybe eight. Maybe, maybe eight. eight. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, it's one of those things in football. You can have a team who has 25 shots, another one has three. The team that has three very occasionally wins the game. It's just it's just the way it goes. And for me, you know, it's it was disappointing to lose in the quarters. It feels like it's, it's regression, but I thought it was a huge step forward from the Euros because England played the best football and were the best team in that World Cup. And I know they didn't win it, but... The best team doesn't always win the World Cup. You know, the best team wins the 38-game league season, but a World Cup or something like that, the best team doesn't always win it. And I thought England were the best team, and I think they'd have, you know, they'd have beaten um, everyone France had to play. I mean, was it Morocco and then Argentina? I think they'd have beaten both of them, and they they should have won that tournament, and they were unlucky not to, I think. Um, but it, it is difficult to judge. I mean, I think he's he's been a really good speaker, a really good ambassador like for the figure, game. He is statesman-like, yeah. yeah. And you can see why he would get on well with Brailsford and get on well with Ratcliffe. Um, you know, you can see why they'd be attracted to him because you could imagine he would represent United really well because he is a good speaker. I think he'd he'd get United. Um, but yeah, I just think it's, like we say, it's, it's just really difficult to judge him um, coming out of international football into not just any club job, but one of the biggest club jobs, if not the biggest club job in the world. I mean, he's not won a trophy. That's the elephant no. in the room and you need to win trophies at, at Manchester United. Um, it is difficult. I mean, I think his personality is a huge part of it. And as you said, he does speak really well. Um, but is that enough to, to manage a club with the stature of the biggest club in England? It's not, is it? No, if we're being honest, it's no. not at all. Um, so where does that leave Eric Ten Hag? I mean, I've just talked about the potential replacements for him and kind of when fans see Southgate links, even if they want Ten Hag out, they probably want him to stay. Mm-hmm. Could this work in his favour over the next few months? If if Southgate is the leading candidate, surely it's better just to maybe stick with uh, Eric Denon. Yeah, well, I think there's a, a strong argument. I think it's one you made him in week that there's not, you know, there's not an obvious candidate out there to replace him. In 2022, it was always a battle between Tenag and Pochettino, and it felt, you know, we said regularly that either felt like there'd be good appointments. You know, I was m- more towards Pochettino. In the end, they probably got it right with Ten Hag. But I think either would have been decent appointments. You know, I think I, I don't think there was a wrong answer there. I think Pochettino would have done better at United than he has done at, at, at Chelsea. You know, that club's a basket case. Um, but it felt like either would have been fine appointments. You look now, 
and there is no obvious candidate. I mean, we're talking about Southgate. I think Graham Potter's, you know, I wouldn't rule Graham Potter out. He's got the obvious attraction of, of being free, essentially. Um, that's another name that's just... Without being, dis- without being disrespectful to these managers, it's not very inspiring. And if, if you're in a United fan listening to this podcast or seeing these links, you're not going to be very happy at that. No, you're not. And maybe, maybe that's a bit unfortunate with Potter because in hindsight, the job he did at Chelsea looks pretty good now. You know, he's doing better than Pochettino did. And I think hindsight probably views that job a little bit better. Yet with Brighton, it feels like they went up another level after De Zerbi. Or they've, they've, gone, they've gone backwards a bit this season. And they never really lost under Potter the way they lose under De Zerbi, um, who is another name that would be in. Well, that's in the another frame. negative with De Zerbi. I mean, he is. There's interest, obviously, in Roberto De Zerbi as well, and he's going to be available, expected Ooh. to be available this summer. That kind of manager, you real merry go round. But there's holes in him. You look at that list, and there's holes in every single yeah. candidate. There's no one you can make a serious case for. I think even Thomas Tuchel, he's kind of flattered his eyelids, hasn't he? Flushed his eyelids at United, but. I mean, his recent record's not been very good. No. He can't win the Bundesliga of Harry Kane then. Well, exactly, yeah. And you know, they, he, he only just won it last season. I know he took over, I think it was sort of springtime last season, but, you know, he didn't, it didn't engineer an immediate change and you could tell there was friction there straight away and that, for me, would be the biggest mark against Tuchel. It's why I just don't see it happening because I don't see Ineos appointing a manager who has essentially fallen out with the people above him at every club he's been at. You know, he, he fell out with people at Dortmund he fell out with people at PSG. He fallen out with people above him in Munich. I don't see Ineos going anywhere near a character like that personally. Even if he is the the biggest name on the on the shortlist, I think they'll want someone who would work in a collaborative structure. And I don't see that being Tuchel particularly. Um, so yeah, so I would rule him out. But like I say, there's, there's question marks over everyone. I mean, De Zerbi, De Zerbi stacks up well from what you hear on 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 the data and stuff like that. And his teams can clearly can clearly play brilliant football at times. And he has done a good job everywhere he's been, but always at mid-ranking clubs. And as we've said so often, when Brighton lose, you know, they, they go they don't go down fighting, they go down in disgrace, don't they? They get absolutely thrashed when they lose. And that's that's gotta be a concern. Um, you know, and I kind of I, I wrote a piece earlier um, at the start of the Europa League saying that their their aggression in the league this year, you can kind of understand because they focused on Europe, because it might be a once in a lifetime thing. They did brilliantly in that group, you know. They won in Ajax, some amazing memories. And you think if they if they do well in in the Europa League, if they finish tenth, it don't really matter because what an experience that is. But then they go and lose four 0 in, in Rome, and you know you're out you're out with that tie before the second leg. And the, you know the, the you're right, yeah you're right. There are there are question marks against every single candidate. I think there is not a name out there. I mean the, the obvious one is Shabby Alonso, but it. It's telling that you know you just aren't in the discussion, are they? You know, I, I think you'll actually go to Bayern Munich. Obviously, Liverpool will have a heavy, heavy interest in their former mm-hmm. player, and as a Liverpool legend, he will going to manage Manchester United. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, it's, not, it's not going to happen. Um, I guess. My argument with Xavi Alonso would be: surely it's easier to win the Bundesliga again than hop into a very competitive Premier League with mm-hmm. Liverpool. Liverpool have got a fantastic side, of course. Um, the struggle the last weekend, though. Um, <laughs> pros and cons of, of keeping Ten Hag. I know I've kind of touched upon them because. Having said all that, and we've just kind of picked holes in the alternatives, but we keep on saying it's not the right reason to keep them just because there's a lack of alternatives. You yeah. shouldn't just survive for that reason, mm-hmm. should you? Um, there's obviously been huge tactical concerns for a long time. We've discussed them on this podcast. Um, and yeah, I guess end of March, they could still win the FA Cup and still qualify for the Champions League. They could, yeah. And if they do that, I don't think Ineos can get rid of him because... One of the biggest things in his corner as well is that the match-going fans remain... It's 50-50, I'd say, now. Yeah, I would say that they remain mostly behind him. There's certainly been no open dissent no. against him, like you know there was against Raniak, like there was against Solskjaer, pretty regularly towards the end of, of Solskjaer's reign. There's been nothing like that, even though that, you know, I mean, I, I can't remember exactly what the stats were, but United have conceded four or more a lot more under Ten Hag than but they did at all, all the previous records are under these managers Van Gaal whatever more he's Solskjaer um, these bad records have all been broken under Ten Hag and you, you kind of see it this season and it, it, it kind of they've reached new lows which is if it happened under previous managers you think fans would be screaming for their heads but I think with, with Ten Hag fans just desperately want him to be the man and sick of this merry-go-round yeah. sick of kind of player power influencing it and they really wanted Ten Hag to be the yeah. guy didn't they? well I think that is a big part of why he has got the respect of, of fans and match going fans especially because he took on that player power with Ronaldo with Rashford last year at, at Wolves with Garnacho on tour last year being late now with Sancho 
you know, he has made the manager's office the most important since at the club again. And I think there was a feeling under Solskjaer and under Ranić that, you know, the, the the fans had it in for the players, essentially, at that point. The, there was, you know, even at the start of Tenag's second game in charge, they lost at Brentford. The, the fans were singing, you're not fit to wear the shirt to the players. And the, the same under Ranić at, at Brighton a few months beforehand. And I think there was a feeling that players were throwing managers under the bus and Tenag came in and took that on immediately. You know, what he did for Ronaldo after Tottenham, Ronaldo after the interview, like we said, Rashford being late. He continued it this year with Sancho, continued this year with Rashford after Belfast. You know, he has he, he has been a disciplinarian and I think the fans like that. And obviously he won he won the Carabao Cup. He did pretty well last season. Well, very well last season. Yeah, excellent uh, let's season. Not to play it, yeah. Um, but I also think, like you say, it it is 50-50. I think the fans desperately want him to succeed. But there are obvious tactical concerns there. There are there are you know numerous concerns. We mentioned last weekend, and I said this on Wednesday that you know, that is going to go down as an iconic Old Trafford day. But you look back now, and it's easy to forget. But for forty minutes of that second half, you know, you were dead. There was nothing. We were sleepwalking. We were sleepwalking to defeat. To defeat. Yeah, and it was. You know, if but for that Anthony goal, and this is you know ridiculous ifs and buts because he did score, but. Until that point, with five minutes to go, your mindset is this is this has been disastrous because they've not thrown a punch in the whole second half, and suddenly they throw one and they score. Then they finish normal time brilliantly. They played really well in extra time with a makeshift team, and it's like you know that was an amazing thirty-five minutes and fair play for Tenard for cobbling together that team as a you know Anthony at left back and Fernandez at centre back. But for forty minutes of the second half, there was no game plan. You know they were they were dead on their feet. They looked knackered um, and. You know, Surely, how quickly things can change like that for him. But we keep talking about oh, this turning point, a turning point, which been overused this this phrase all yeah. season. We've been on this podcast saying it has to be the turning point, and the turning point, unfortunately, has never really come. Um, if you could see what he's trying to do in a tactical sense, and there was a clear plan, you could kind of get behind it a bit more, couldn't you? And I think that's been the, the glaring problem. If there's not a, a distinct style of play on the on the pitch. They should be. He spent over four hundred million on yeah. players. He's been in charge for over eighteen months. Yeah, and that's just not good enough, really. I mean, obviously there has been an injury crisis, but you saw Tottenham come to Old Trafford. I know it was only a draw in January. I think they were without their five best players. To play United off the park mm. without their best players. Yeah, and 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 possibly Coglu's uh, style of play stumbled over that there. <laughs> um, you could see what he was trying to do though, and his yeah. style and his fingerprints is all over that team. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and we, we said that why we can't really see what Tenag wants to do. I mean, we, you know, it's, it's been forgotten now, but at half-time at the Liverpool game, there was that image going viral of, again, the space in United's midfield. It was essentially two lines, 50, 60 yards apart. Well, how many games have we seen that in the season? All the time. So all the time. And, you know, you can see Tenag's point when he's saying, I'm having to play defenders who aren't that quick and we're having to defend in a low block. But he's still, they're still pressing high at the other end of the pitch and it is creating that space and that vacuum and, you know, you've got you've got to be adaptable, and I think it's you know, it's a difficult one because we, we've done all these stats, and it's like eleven games. I think two hundred and twenty three shots against them in eleven games now, but they've also won eight of the last ten. And you kind of put those stats to Ten Hag, and he's kind of like, well, it doesn't matter the low quality chances, and it's like, well, yeah, maybe there's there's a degree to which certainly the Everton game they had twenty three shots. You know, they were generally low quality chances. But the odds are eventually one of them's going to go. A better in. team takes some of those. Chances. Yeah, a better team takes some of those chances. And yeah, I just I think the last the last couple of months are so hard to judge because those concerns are still there. Yet they have won eight at the last ten. I mean, the biggest change has been the got the goals. Um, you know, I I did a piece earlier this week that I think when they lost at West Ham on the twenty third of December, they'd not scored that was four successive games without a goal. I think they went four hundred and fifty minutes in December without scoring. But since that West Ham game, they've scored in every game they've played. Scored them like 32 goals in the last 14 games, I think it is. And that, even when you're facing 20 shots a game, that's going to get you more wins. Um, so It's feast of feast famine, isn't it? With the goals? It is. Well, that's it. Yeah, the, the change has been incredible in terms of the number of goals they, can, they, they, um, they score. And if they can continue that, if they can continue, I think it's something like 2.3 goals a game since that West Ham game. And if they keep that up, you are generally going to win more matches than, than not. Um, but they do have to have to keep that up because you always fear 
they're going to concede. You don't you don't really go into many games expecting them to keep clean sheets. We're talking about this managerial situation, but the reality is we should actually have some clarity soon. I mean, Euro 2024 starts mid-June. Mm. United start their pre-season early July. So really, there's going to be a decision made if it hasn't already been made in the next two months or so, the next six weeks. So that's pretty imminent, really. So we should... You'd think so. I mean, yeah. this, this is probably another issue with with Southgate in that I don't I don't get the impression he would want to destabilise what might be his last tournament by saying I'm off to United. But he, if he is, you'd have to make you'd have to remove Tenor before that, surely. Yeah, you would. You just keep yeah. it, I mean, it, it, it could of execution. Yeah, it could become a major distraction. There's no point letting Ten Hag plan pre-season in in granular detail if he's not going to be in charge. So I think. I think by the end of the season, you need a decision on on Ten Hag's future at the very least. And you know, he's, I mean, he's going to have a year left on his contract at the end of this season. So, you, I mean, I guess you don't have to start contract talks until early next season when you can see how significant the changes are. But yeah, I think you know, certainly with Ten Hag, by the last day of the season, you want to know is he is he staying? Is he planning next season, or, or is he not? We'll leave it there for part one. Then uh, we'll be back in a moment for part two. Welcome back to part two of the Manchester is Red podcast. I am joined with, um, what's your name again? Sorry. Samuel. <laughs> uh, Samuel's on holiday, so it can't be. Is it Rich? Rich, yeah. yeah Rich is dead. Uh, Kobe Manu, England called off then, Tyrone. Um, obviously, he was supposed to spend the international break with the under 21s, but he's been promoted to the senior team. Um, I watched a clip of him when he was talking to England media team. He just had an absolute wide smile across his face, beaming. What a fantastic few moments, and it's richly deserved. Yeah, he's done a lot of media, doesn't he? Doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, he has. He has done a lot. Of if you're watching, you're so right, fantastic quote. He can talk. He has got a voice. Yeah, be, be nice to be nice to talk to him every now and again. Um, yeah, and he's like I say he's spoken. He's spoken really well. Um, I mean, it was telling that he was called in to the squad on on Tuesday, wasn't it? It wasn't. Uh, you know, we often get these emails from the FA England squad update, and it's like so and so's out, and so and so's been called up. No one dropped out. It was just like we've got to add Kobe Mainu in because we watched him against Liverpool and Flipper Eck. What a talent. Um, so yeah, it, it's looked a matter of time. I mean, he just looks so, so good, doesn't he? He is undoubtedly the biggest positive of, of this season. Um, you know, I mean, I, there's, there's probably an argument you might end up winning play with the season at, at, at this rate. Um, just been... Which is remarkable because he didn't play for the first half. Of the season. <laughs> Incredible. I mean, he came yeah. back late October, obviously had yeah. the ankle injury. That, that is the only reason it delayed him coming back into yeah. the team. Played a few games in the 21s, like you say, Goodison Bach. And now for his full debut, Tyrone, a Goodison, that 3-0 yeah. win over Everton, that was a special performance. It was. And, you know, we've been talking about Tanag and, and the future in, in the first part. Whatever happens, he deserves immense credit for not not spotting Mainu because a player like that is always going to be spotted but for playing him and having the faith in him. And I think he might have started the season in the team. That It was telling that that Real Madrid friendly, when he got injured, he started in that game when it was the strongest team. And I think it's, I think he it started with, was it Mount or Fernandez playing on the right? And Mainu was in midfield. You know, it, it, it was telling then that Ten Hag had obviously seen enough during pre-season. And it wasn't a case, a lot of times you'd see a player like that in pre-season, a manager would have think, he looks good, I'll start him on the bench. Ten Hag was clearly thinking, he's ready for my team. And it was telling that, that that Everton game, I mean, he'd, he'd not been back in training for long, but he hadn't come off the bench and suddenly it was like, bang, straight in there, in you go. And he's just, he's been fantastic since. I mean, I've, I remember writing a piece after the Luton game, you know, it won 2-1 at, at Luton. And again, it was another chaotic end-to-end game. And I felt the only time United ever had control of that game was when the 18-year-old was on the ball. You know, the rest of the time it was it was chaos um, you know, Casemiro was chasing shadows at times. Fernandez was all over the place in the kind of way that Fernandez is in terms of chasing everything. And the ball had come to Mainu. It'd have Ross Barkley one side, another loose play right behind him, and it just like dribble out, find a way out, he's, he's under he's pressure. pressure. Resistant, isn't he? Uh, um, but, I mean, so that's his biggest strength for me: yeah. his ability to get get out from those those difficult situations, like you say, be press resistant. And he's, you know, he's dribbling. We saw it against Liverpool a couple of times when he can just spot the smallest of gaps and, and that ability to create space is a, a major, major asset in his game. And I mean, it's only a matter of time until um, he's, I wouldn't be surprised if he was starting come the European Championships because that, that England midfield is Rice, Bellingham and one other, isn't it? And I think previously it's been Calvin Phillips at times, it's been Jordan Henderson at times. 
Phillips ain't in the squad. You know, both of them, I think, have got serious question marks over their, their place there. So it's it's one other. I think Trent Alexander-Arnold's got a chance of that role with England. Like, you know, like we were saying in the first half, it's, it's slower, you get more time on the ball. And I think that would suit someone like Alexander-Arnold, but he's obviously injured as well. Um, you know, you have to try to think of who else could even be in contention for that There's role. no huge competition. That's no. the thing. And you'd think Manu as the number eight would be perfect yeah. to play alongside yeah. Bell and Rice. Yeah, well, I've read... well, it's just probably going to come too soon, I think. I think it will. I think I think it might, this international break, but I really wouldn't rule it out in the Euros. And, um, you know, he is... He is the he's the missing he's the missing link in that midfield metaphorically and literally isn't he between Rice and Bellingham like I think he that trio would be unbelievable and I mean United United could have had all, all three yeah. of them you think there's an eighteen year old a twenty year old and a twenty five year old there I mean they could play together for the next ten years for England three World Cups two years yeah I mean quite possibly and they all look <laughs> if not I mean I think Rice and Bellingham are world class already and Mainu looks on his way there I mean that is a serious serious midfield um, and you know I'm sure there'll be a few United scouts and, and coaches looking at that thinking you know what what if I mean obviously the Bellingham one you know it's not necessarily the one that gets away I mean they did they did push pretty hard for him beyond kidnapping when he's at Carriage and there's not a lot a lot more you can do Rice uh, you know I think if they had their time again they might push a bit harder for Rice before he the year of the year before he goes to Arsenal or two years before he goes to Arsenal they spent 125 million on Casemiro and Mount over two summers the year before they might have got Rice for 80, 90 million and just sign him instead of those two and I think your midfield looks better already because you know, I, I think I think Rice is a phenomenal he's, player he's been valued at 100 million hasn't oh, he yeah. for yeah. Arsenal he's, that's the thing he's, he's been, been massive for Arsenal yeah. and not just in terms of his quality on the pitch but his, his leadership and you know he's a proper leader isn't he that most serious midfield yeah I remember I did open training um, you know he played Galatasaray after that Everton game at Goodison Park and we were all chatting on the sideline watching the players and the talk that morning was about me and you getting into the England squad and bear in mind he just had his full day yeah and we were all kind of thinking, are we having this conversation? It's not a bit bonkers, but such was the quality of his performance. I've also told this story a few times on this podcast. I spoke to someone 80 months ago who looked me in the eye and said, me and you will play for England. And his confidence really struck us. And I mean, it wasn't misplaced, was it? No. I think those who knew him and those at the club kind of knew what talent they had. And they've been proved right over the last six months. It's been a remarkable rise. Obviously, England have Brazil and Belgium tie in the next few days. Um, could he get a cameo? Because they are just friendlies and it is really possible. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think now you've called him in. I think you've you've got to play him at, at some point. Um, you know, I'm sure there's uh, I'm sure there's value to seeing him in training and seeing him close up. But if he wasn't going to play him, I think you'd have been as wise to leave him with the under twenty ones. I mean, let's bear in mind he's not even played for the under twenty ones, so that itself would have been a new experience for him. So I think the fact he's been called up to the seniors, you know, you've got to give him a run. You've got to give him a, a try, and whether that's a half, you know maybe more likely a half against Belgium than a half against Brazil. Do you think you get a half? Yes, but I don't know. I mean, even if it's just a a talking five minutes at the end of the game. I'm starting to think what other midfielders are even in the squad, to be honest. Uh, Conor Gallagher, I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, You know, a a lot of those, a lot of the play, I mean, maybe James Madison's in there, but he's not, you know, you're not going to play Rice, Madison and Bellingham as a midfield, I don't think. So it feels like there's an obvious gap in that squad for kind of like a number between a number six and a number eight and I think you know I think Mainu's got it have you got the squad there I don't <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to get it up there but it's for some reason it's not going to you, you, see, you sat there with so much confidence <laughs> that I thought you'd got it you, you should have just given me a shake of the head and I wouldn't I wouldn't have thrown you under the bus <laughs> yeah for this year, uh, yeah unfortunately not um, but I mean, it would be fantastic to see and whether or not he actually plays his remains oh, I've got it here actually midfielders Drew Bellingham, Conor Gallagher Jordan Henderson God, James James Madison Declan Rice and obviously Cobby Mainu yeah. yeah I mean I think I, I, I'd be surprised if he didn't play with with that list because you know I think I think a half might be ask, asking a bit much Mainly and Gallagher are probably the only ones that could I mean the, the thing is Gallagher's ball. been playing as a number 10 for Chelsea yeah he's been um, playing very high up and I kind of suggest that he would be the link this summer but he's been playing higher up he's yeah. not he's not number 8 really no no, no no then that that role you know I mean Declan Rice can you know he's been playing quite high up for, for Arsenal with Jorginho behind him but I think you can have Rice sitting and then if Bellingham's going to play as a number 10 like he does for Real Madrid which he may as well do the, the quality of his performance is there you need someone between the two and looking at that I mean it's Maynou Gallagher or Henderson isn't it and you know, I'm sure Henderson will will start at least one of those games but I, I just think Maynou's bound to get 
at least whether it, whether a half is too much, you're about to get at least some some action for sure. He feels like a player United have to build their midfield around, mm-hmm. doesn't he? Uh, for the next ten years, I mean, you look at that midfield at the moment, and he started a lot of games alongside Fernandez and uh, Casemiro in 2024. Um, but, I mean, Casemiro's legs, they're going on the tie. Um, and he seems incapable of making a 10 yard pass now. Yeah. He's been very poor, actually, in the last few weeks. So, is it the case of signing a, a new number six to complement Manu in the summer? Um, and with that midfield, potentially with a world class defensive midfielder, Kobe Manu and Bruno Fernandes, is that something to, to be excited about? Because I think that would be title challenging, in my opinion. <laughs> if you could get, if you could, see if you had someone like Declan Rice. Obviously, yeah. the rest of the team needs fixed. We're, 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 <laughs> what I was going to yeah, say, yeah, no, yeah. That, that, that midfield is worth... Yeah, yeah, yeah. The midfield. Midfield is a key word. It's as good a midfield as... Just depending on who they got as that holder, it's, it yeah. could be as good a midfield as, as any other. But you put Declan league. Rice in there as we've discussed. Yeah. That would be a fantastic midfield. Yeah, it would. Unfortunately, they're not going to get Rice no. this summer. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I think they need to move on from, from Casemiro. I think they need to try and get rid. I think the fact there's just three years left on his contract, that he's on 350 grand a week or so, it's just too big a risk to keep him, really. Um, so if you can get, you know, if, if a Saudi club comes in for this summer, snap your hand off. I mean, I guess the big, the big issue with um, the big issue with that midfield you mentioned is Mason Mount. I mean, they've just signed him for fifty-five Who? million. Where's he going to play? Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, I mean, great squad player, but you don't really spend fifty-five million on a squad player when you're so you're struggling so much with financial. Is, is return really well under the radar? Actually, didn't it? Yeah, understandably it did. so. Yeah, yeah, last weekend, did. did you discuss it on the Monday podcast? Uh, I didn't do the Monday podcast. Right. Didn't you do it? No. Who did the Monday? You did the Monday podcast. See what I mean? Oh yeah, I did. It's been Monday a long podcast, week. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot Tyrone's name, and he's sorry that he did the podcast that was on Wednesday. On Monday, the yeah, international yeah. break does bad things to people. Yeah. In my defence, I was on a stag do in York over the weekend, so Monday was a bit hazy. But I hope you listened to the podcast. It was good quality. Uh, but no, it was a very low key. Yeah, we, did, we didn't discuss Mason. Mate. Yeah, it's a very because that that's that's what it says. All doesn't it? Really yeah. um, did make his return. It's been I was going to say highly anticipated, but it's not really been highly anticipated. Mm, well, no, Kobe Mane's done so well that that, that I mean that's the exact role. Mount was signed for really but now does his long term future not look like it's going to lie in the wing perhaps when you look at Manu in that midfield or... maybe but then I mean Garnacho's kind of made that right wing spot his own this is I mean Mount you'd say would be next in line for Manu's place Fernandez's place maybe Garnacho's place but I guess Anthony's there but he could be next in line for three places but that still places him on the bench if everyone's fit do you not hear that though I mean when you sign a new player in my opinion you should have their position it should be settled and Mount's come into the club he was signed to play a deeper role it's not really worked out he's been had bad fortune with injuries to be fair which has disrupted what he can do in his impact but now you're looking at it and he doesn't have a defined position and that cannot help him winning the starting role no definitely not and if he ends up in this position where he plays you know, I mean, say Fernandez at some point gets injured. Seems unlikely. It's, it's never going to happen. No, it's no, never going to happen. No, you know, say he plays three games there, and then he drops back and plays two games in a deeper midfield role. Then he plays three games on the right wing. It is hard to settle into that rhythm. And like I said, I think he's a, a brilliant squad player. And if United, you know, if United get to the Champions League and do well in the cups last year, there will be enough games for him to play. But you know, I think it's pretty clear he was signed to be a key part of that midfield. And mainly we've done so well that he's essentially not been needed now. And you know, I don't think anyone would select Mount over over Mainu. Um It sounds like Donny Van der Beek when we kind of came to the club. We'll think, well, if Fernandez drops out of the team, he might yeah, get a chance. Yeah. Then Van der Beek was tried in, in deeper positions, and now look where he is. He can't get a kick for I for Frank. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying that's going to happen to, to Mason Mount, but it's it already feels like a shame because I think he is a brilliant footballer, as you yeah, said, and yeah. showed such quality with Chelsea and with England. But he needs to get his career back on track. Obviously, England have got the Euros this summer. Mount was never going to be in the end, that squad. No, it would be a major surprise if he got in that, that squad. Like I said, there's a few question marks over that midfield, but I don't I don't see him getting in the squad at the moment um, because I don't see him playing enough games for United, really. And, you know, like I say, there's no, there's probably no real obvious... Rep- I mean, I guess Amrabat would be the obvious stand-in for Casemiro or McTominay, but... You know, McTominay is playing so high up the pitch. I don't really think he's. Well, you got the answer out of the weekend. Play that role. Samira is absent, and McTominay plays. McTominay plays, but then McTominay plays so high up. Um, you know that it's almost. You know, I guess they're rotating a little bit, but I don't think anyone sees Maynou's f- future as a, a holding midfielder. He's he's too good. Um, you know, in in those little spaces around the box because his feet are so quick. Um, so yeah, there's there's an obvious question mark there, but there's definitely no. There's no clear route back into this team for, for Mason Mount. And the problem is it's not just at United now where he struggled. 
his last season at Chelsea was was underwhelming really. And he, you know, he is he does need some kind of spark now to, to get back on track. Luke Shaw joined up with the England camp. He's obviously injured and could be out for the rest of the season. But I, I just kind of mentioned in the first part how I like what Southgate's done with that camp. And mm. obviously Shaw's not actually going to be involved or trained. But I like how he's kind of invited in. He's part of the group because he's played such a key role for England over the last few years and he should have an important role to play this summer. Yeah, yeah. And it's telling that a lot of these players want to go yeah. in when they're injured. You know, we've seen it in previous um, international breaks that injured players want to go in previously. You know, previously you've had thick players pulling out of that squad not wanting to play. Now you've got injured players wanting to go just to, to see their mates, essentially. So, you know, that does tell you about the type of environment that, that Southgate can create. And I think, you know, Luke Shaw is, is not just United's left first choice left back when he's fit. He's England's first choice left back. And I know Southgate said it was touch and go for the Euros. I mean, I I I don't I uh, I can't see him not getting in that squad. It it seems he's gonna be back in May. United season could go on to May the 25th with the cup final and you'd like to expect now they'll get in the cup final so even if he's only getting half an hour in the cup final there's then going to be a few England friendlies to to get in and, and, and play a few games so I think he's definitely in that squad and you know there's not a lot of competition at left back if it's Shaw and Chilwell I mean Chilwell can't hold down a place in, in Chelsea he can't stay fit can he Chilwell no he can't uh, ironically that's no, sure, sure. sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I mean maybe Joe Gomez will end up yeah, playing there yeah. the way things are going but I'd certainly have, I'd, I'd take a risk on Shaw even if he's not fully fit because I just think there's such a big gap between him and the next best left back. Harry Maguire, did you read his interview this morning? Uh, yeah. He sat down with yeah. journalists to St. George's Park. He spoke quite well. He always does, to be fair. He's quite good value when he speaks. Um, I thought the most notable line really was his response to critics and he discussed his season in 21-22, which was obviously a really poor season for Maguire. He took a lot of stick, didn't he? Um, his performances weren't good enough. And then obviously last season, he lost his place, slipped on the peck and order to Sandro Martinez and Rafa Varane. I keep calling him Rafa, as if I know him. Rafael Varane <laughs> uh, started centre-half and obviously he was stripped of the captaincy as well. But he's come through that uh, tie. We've kind of praised him a lot on this podcast this season because I don't think we expected it. And he showed incredible mental strength and he discussed that in the interview. And I think it's been really impressive. Yeah, I, I mean, so much respect for what he's achieved this season. Um, you know, I've, I've used the phrase a few times, he was a pantomime villain. Uh, even at the start of the season, he was a pantomime villain. He's getting he's getting cheered by opposing fans when he's on the pitch because they're expecting him to make an error. And, you know, that must be so hard when 50, 60,000 people are doing that for you. He's getting hammered on social media, getting hammered by pundits at times. And, you know, it, again, we're coming back to, to Southgate, but, you know, I, I thought it was right what he said after that Scotland friendly, whenever that was back in October or November, that, um, you know, it, it, there was it, the way he was treated was totally unfair, really. And it was modern social media. I, you know, I mean, Southgate was putting it on the media. I think it probably means social media with things like that. I'm not sure the media... You know, the media have been critical of Maguire because he's not played very well. There's but, a difference between fair criticism and kind of personal... Yeah, and you know, mockery, uh, yeah. really. It, you know, it became it became mockery at times, didn't it? Maguire I mean, would see himself his performances had... Yeah, good of course he would. Of course he would. You know, I, you know, I've been on the last two pre-season tours and he was booed on both of them by by United fans, essentially. Um, you know, I mean, one, one United... Um, staff member tried to say in the when he was booed at the MCG that it was just the, that Aussie Aussie you know the the Aussie mentality that they like to wind someone up. I thought that was you know the MCG hadn't seen spin like that since Shane Warne was was in his pomp. Um, I'm not alone, but <laughs> I used that one at the time. Very well done. <laughs> Very well. Um, you know it was he, he was booed because there'd become this perception, certainly not amongst Old Trafford regulars and match going fans, but the the wider United fan base. That he was, a, a, you know, a walking disaster essentially, and he, he was getting so much stick, um, and just like I say, it, it was it become personal. It was, you know, he was being being. It was, I just thought it was really difficult to come back from that. And fair play to him this summer, saying no, I'm not going to go to West Ham. I'll you know I'll stay. And in that Scotland game as well, did he did he score an own goal? If I remember, yeah, he did. So I thought he started that Scotland game because he, he came on at half time yeah. and he played really well. His passing was really good. Scotland fans, I can't remember if they were booing or cheering his every touch. But I remember tweeting during it, during it, saying like, you know, I don't know why they're cheering him because he's playing really well. And then five minutes later, he scores an own goal. When it was one of those, like you can't do a lot about it. But, but it, lot, it just summed up what was happening for him. A lot of time. time during that period, there was a lot of elements of bad luck yeah. where kind of freak things without on the ball was the hit off his thigh or his and things just didn't seem to be going right for them. No, the, exactly. You did feel sorry for him. You did feel sorry for him. And that Scotland game is a classic example because 
you know, about I think about twenty five minutes into the second half, you're thinking he's you know he's made all his passes here. He looks pretty good, even though he's he's getting ridiculed by the Scotland fans. Then he scores an own goal and just must want the ground to swallow him up. And you're thinking this is just this is classic Harry Maguire for the last two years that he is you know he is only ever one you know one moment away from going back into to win for me and being ridiculed and the mental strength to recover from that I think is so so impressive you know so impressed with what he's done this season because it must be at that level when you're not you're not trying to get yourself out of a rut you know a, a personal rut when it's just you dealing with your inner demons it's every time you come on 50,000 people in the stadium are watching waiting for you to make a mess of things millions more on telly to have the resolve to to stand up and find your form and find your confidence again and doing it on the most scrutinised club in the world. You know, I just think he deserves so much respect this season. Not a lot, and of, he was, not a lot he of people was, could do that, could they? No, no, not a lot of people could do that. You know, that would, I don't, you know, we, I, we can do that. No. Um, and, you know, it, it, shows, it shows the mental strength that these players have at times. And you always see, like, you will see that we'd, we're guilty of doing it as well. And you say to players, you know, they should move on and just accept going to play for West Ham rather than being fourth choice at United. But you don't get to United by thinking you're going to be fourth choice. He'd have looked at it and thought, well, I'm going to get in front of Varane. I'm going to get in front of Martinez. And he probably has got in front of Varane this season. Um, and, you know, if, if, he'd have, if he'd have come out publicly and said in the summer, I'm going to get in front of Varane in this team, we would all have ridiculed him and said, that is ridiculous. But he would have believed it and he's done it. And, you know... I just, I just think he deserves a lot of respect and a lot of credit for the way he's gone about this season on and off the pitch. And you know, I mean, he was absolutely brilliant when he came on against Liverpool. I thought in in both boxes, really. Um, so yeah, fair. You know, tip of the cap to him. I think he's done done brilliantly. And Sandra Martinez, he's flown out to Argentina. Similar situation with Luke Shaw. He's not expected back any time to see away, but he just wants to be with the Argies, doesn't he? I guess. <laughs> and then have a good time. <laughs> Why not get a few barbecues? Yeah, get, uh, get that herbal tea they drink. <laughs> Is there anything else that caught your eye across the international break? Because we'll get to the end of these podcasts and we'll kind of run out of stuff to talk about. Yeah, now. yeah. I think we have all that stuff. Yeah, I can't think of. We can't think of anything. A good else. episode, nonetheless. What, what's well. your name again? Uh, God, God, God. Yeah, I didn't I think, think so. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Ty. Thanks for your time. No problem, Stephen. <laughs> and thanks to the listeners. As usual, we're actually going to be back on Wednesday for a very special podcast. Nathan yes. Aspinall, he's world number four at darts. Fantastic darts player. And he's a very big United fan. So it was a pleasure to chat to him. Uh, it's a really good interview. Uh, so check that out on your audio platforms. Have a great weekend and take care.